Okay, let us shift our gears a little bit. We are going to, for the second part of class today, talk about a different type of element we're going to model, and that's the structure of the building. Okay, and we've been sort of playing around putting floors and walls and curtain walls and roofs on things, making some very broad assumptions about what the structure may look like. But today we're actually going to start putting beams and beam systems and just the detailed structural elements. And it's very nice to go ahead and think about those things, even as part of your architectural design. Not that you are ultimately going to go through and size all those elements. You still will probably be working with someone who's doing the structural engineering, who will go through and do the detailed analysis and apply the loads and really size those members. But if you can, in your model, encode your intent, oh, I'd really like the beams to be here and here and the columns to come down this way, that it's giving the structural engineer something to work with that, to help just communicate what your design intent was. It's, it's always good for us to try and you know, just think through what the structural system is in the same way that we should think through what the materials and the lighting will be. You know, st structure's not an afterthought. If we do it very, very well, some of our most beautiful buildings are ones where the structure is really a very integral piece of the building. It's really a featured aspect of it, not just something we hid behind a lot of veneer panels. Okay, so structure is a very good thing to appreciate right up front. So we want to give you a way to start thinking about it early on. Okay, it's going to start with the whole notion of basically oh, just setting up grids and then adding elements to our model. And to get us started with that, what I'm going to do is shift on over to, where am I going? Make that big again. I will say open. And what I will do is go on out to, I'm going to go back out to the L drive again and find something. There's a file out there that's a good one to start with. You can get it there or you can get it out there on coursework, either one. Session 14. And I'm going to grab the one that says structural framing starting point. Say OK to that. And what we're going to be bringing in is actually just a system of grid lines. It's really just lines which are indicating the locations of where some of my columns are going to be and how I want to lay out the building. Now, these grid lines I've already set up. It's for a design that I have in mind. This is going to be, I'd call it an arc-shaped building. It's going to have a gentle sweep to it. It's kind of like the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas or something like that. Just sort of a gentle sweep. Okay. And in terms of these different grid lines, I've created the grid lines. I've taken a grid, and I've read a radial array. So these ones that are radiating out from that point, I've arrayed around evenly. These other ones, which are arced, I created by creating them and offsetting them the same distance. And it's actually a little bit complicated to set up that grid, so I'm not going to do it in class. We can lose a lot of people there. So it's really more important to put the structural elements on the grid. Let me set up a very simple grid so that you can just sort of get an idea of what the grids are like. And then we'll go through and place some structural elements using the grids. Grids are actually right up here. Let me pop back over to the Home tab. Grids are right next to levels. They appear when we're in plan views. I can choose the grid tool. And at its simplest level, I'm just going to go through and drag grid lines out. Now, grids really don't have any meaning other than as serving as a referencing system. It's just axes that we can use to place walls or place things on those grids. And the nice thing about using grids is as follows. They have these designations. They have numbers to them, like G and H. Those are the latest numbers. Or those are the numbers that appeared after the ones that are in that sort of radial array downstairs there. Let me pull down here. For this one, what I'm going to do is actually change it. So instead of being I, I'm going to go through and make it grid line 1 instead. Change its label. Oh, actually, one's already in use downstairs on that other grid. Let me make it to 10. That'll be a little bit easier. And now I can go through and create some more grids. Home, grid. And again, this system is really just all about locating things. There's grid 11. I'll put grid 12 out here. What it's doing is it's picking up the last number, and it's just kind of continuing from there. So the idea is as follows. If I come in and I want to choose a specific location, that intersection right there, I can refer to as G10. 
I don't have to say, oh, the lower right-hand corner of the building or the southeast corner of the building or something that might be a little imprecisely misinterpreted. Okay, I'm going to say that's specifically G10, and everyone knows exactly what I'm talking about at that location. So as we work with bigger buildings, it's actually very ha handy and helpful to go through and set up these grids. Now, what do you do with the grids after you set them up? They're really just a referencing system, so I can do things. I can place columns on the grids. We'll do that in just a moment. I can use the grids to place walls. Let me show you what that might look like. I'll grab some walls. I'll just go ahead and grab these concrete walls. Kind of stretch them out there. I didn't place them on the grids, but what I'm going to do is use my align tool to bring them to the grids. And how I'm going to do that is under modify, I'll say align. I'll just grab the grid line and choose the center line, and I'll lock it. I can use the align tool to grab the grid line, the center line, and I'll lock it. Yes, Farzan? Sometimes when you see the lock sign that you don't lock it at the moment, and you switch away, you lose that mark. Yeah. Is there any quick way to get back? It's generally to try to do the real, oh, actually, let's take that back. You can realign it. Let me show what Farzan is asking about. If I say like this, Okay, and just say, no, I don't want to lock that right now. It goes away. What can we do? I think what I would do then is actually just do, it's going to sound weird, but I'm going to realign it. I'm going to align that, and I'm going to choose the center line of the wall. Can you see down at the bottom right left-hand corner, it says eight concrete wall, eight inch reference? Okay, and lock it again, even though it didn't move it. It might be helpful for you to move it away and then bring it back again. But there's no easy way just to grab it again. Now, the reason I like putting things aligning to grids is, oh, what I'll typically do is actually run my dimensions to the grid lines. I'll put a dimension from here to here. We like grid line dimensions because they're real easy to spot and lay out a building that way. So. If I want to go through and change the shape of my building, or the size of my building, I can go through and grab the grid line. I'll see that's 64 feet, and if I really want that to be 60 feet instead, I could just change the dimension, and the walls move that way. So it's nice to hang things off the grids. If you hang them off the grids and things need to change, your base size goes from 25 feet to 22 feet, just everything moves very dynamically that way. So just a really good way of laying out a building. Okay, We're going to use this same notion of grids to go through and lay out our building. So again, over here, grids, we just choose the grid tool. And we create the grid lines. We can draw the lines. Another way we can create grids, let me just kind of show you that real quickly, is I already have some grids. I can choose the grid tool. Let me choose it over here. And I can use this thing where I pick it and I enter an offset. Let me put an offset of, say, 20 feet. Then I can add another grid, add another grid, add another grid. Offsetting is a, a very nice way. And in big buildings, we often do that. The grids will be at very regular spacings like that. And that's a quick way of grabbing a whole bunch of them. OK. but. Let me get rid of those grids so they don't confuse us, because we're going to focus on these grids which have been created right down here, this radial grid system and these arc grids. Okay, Those arc grids, are I created those with the offset. That way it always traced the same profile, and I didn't have to worry about relocating the center. So I got my grids down. What we're going to start with from a structural standpoint is actually just putting some columns in there. So columns are going to be fairly easy to place. We're going to find that instead of just being architectural columns, they're structural columns, and we can choose their type. So there's some grid or columns that we want that aren't currently loaded. We can load them from the library, setting their height walls, and we can place them by clicking on locations and rotating the columns into place. So let's start with that. We'll come back over. Let me kind of even zoom on in here a little bit closer so you can sort of see. I want to put a column right at that intersection. What I'm going to do is go to the column tool and choose structural column. I'll say, oh, do I want the square column or the round column or maybe the wide flange steel column? Not any of those. I'm going to actually go out and load a different one. I'm going to load from uh, the, arc, uh, the uh, 
library. I'll say structural columns, concrete. I'm going to get a rectangular one. Again, don't worry if you're not keeping up. You can just use the square one or the round one. That's OK, too. <laughs> it's not going to be too critical for what we're doing today. I can choose one of the column sizes. Again, these sizes are really just sort of a preliminary guess based on my intuition about what I've seen in some of my past buildings. If this is wrong, no worries. Yeah. When I do the analysis and do the resizing, those changes will percolate back into my model here. Correct, correct. If you want to make a different size, it's as easy as we'll just change the type properties and I can duplicate it the way we have been doing and then change the sizes in there, just like doors and windows. So I'm going to grab that oh, 18 by 24 column, and I'm going to place it right on this grid. Let me zoom on even closer so I can show you just really precisely how it's being placed. Now notice when I try to place it, it doesn't line it up with the grid very well. It keeps it in the XY system, but it's not really aligning to my grid. So what I can do is, if I want to rotate that, try hitting the space bar, and it'll rotate around trying to orient itself to the grid. Okay. So I'll space it over. I kind of want it oriented that way. When I'm happy, I can click. That column's in place. I can then go on over to the next grid location. There it is. If I want to put one up here, I can space and rotate it around. When I'm happy with the orientation, I'll put it in there. Notice as I'm putting them in here, I'm specifying a height. And I'm specifying what, specifying what level to go up to. I'll go up to level two. And I will come on down here. And I'll put the third one in. And I'll space bar a few times and say OK. Now, you guys know me pretty well now in terms of doing things that are repetitive. I hate doing things that are repetitive like this. So there's always a shortcut. And I'll always show you what that shortcut is. There's this fantastic mode up here called placing them on grids. And placing on grids says, you know, if you're going to put grids down there, why don't you just show me what grid lines you have inter you're interested in? And anywhere there's an intersection, I'll put a column there. Okay, so let's take a look at that. I'll zoom on out. I got all my grid lines hanging around in there. No worries. I'll go back to column, structural column, and say on grids instead. And what I can do is actually just choose a grid line. And what happens is as soon as I choose an intersection, I control click to get the intersection, you'll see what happens is at that intersection of those two grid lines, it kind of ghosts in, oh, here's a candidate. If you'd like me to put a column there, you can say OK and select this. But it's, that's what's happening at the intersection. Let me click this one. Oh, there's another good one. I can intersect these grids, too, and then I get some more columns. Isn't that nice? It tries to be smart. So I'm going to control click, control click, control click, and control click. And what I've done is I've placed almost all my columns. I'm still out these three columns on the front row. I'm going to go back and put them in a second, because I've already put some over here. So I'm going to make that a separate selection. But when I'm happy with these selections, I say finish the selection. Actually, I lost that one there. Control, 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 control. Finish. Okay. And what I've done is actually created like a little minefield, this little mini Stonehenge of all these like uh, columns. Would it, have, would it be repetitive columns if you place them twice? Yes, it would actually put two on top of each other. Okay, which could be okay because I could always go back and delete one. Yeah, I would say this tool is good for getting started, but you could always go back and move and edit and change the columns a little bit. But it's a good starting point. It's just really quick. Okay, let me go through. I'll put some more columns in there for those final locations. Again, I'm going to do this as a separate operation just because I'm going to only select some of the grids. I'm going to select that front grid, but the second time I'm only going to grab one, two, and three. Now see if you can get your columns in there and come up with something that looks like this. Okay, we doing good? We got columns? Yep. Excellent. 
Once you put your columns in there, the very next step you probably want to do is put some beams in that span between the columns. And here's how we do that. There's a beam tool. We're going to specify some beam properties. Primarily, we're going to choose the type of the beam and its dimensions. Okay, we can specify the placement plane. That's the height at which to put the beam. We have to be a little bit careful when we're putting beams because depending upon which view we're looking at, we have this issue of in a floor plan view, it's going to put it below our feet versus above our heads. In a ceiling plan view, it's going to put it above our heads. What tends to happen that's confusing about beams is if I want to put the beams that are supporting level two, they're kind of above my head in level one, what I need to do is go to level two and put them in there and it'll put them below the floor level. It's a little backwards that way. Or I can do it in 3D, which I tend to like to do because then I can control that more accurately. So watch out for that one. There's this whole issue of beams. And the most common thing that happens with beams is you put them in and you just can't see them for some reason. It's usually because they're above your head. So if you're in a floor plan view and they're above your head, just switch to a ceiling plan view. Or even better, you often just go to a 3D view and find it and figure out how high it is or how low it is and then adjust it to elevation based on that. But it's really common when you put in beams that you may just get them in the wrong place. So I'm going to go back over here. What I'm going to do is go back to the Home tab, and I'll choose the Beam tool. Now, if you're in Revit Architecture, okay, the Beam tool shows up in this little Structure subsection. Okay? If you're in Revit Structure, which you can be doing this all in Revit Structure just as easily, okay, the beams are front and center. They're very prominent because you're working with columns and beams and structural slabs and things like that as your primary element. It's the same tool. It's just sort of two different tools. They organize the way the tools are presented in the palettes a little bit differently. For now, let's just work in structure, or excuse me, architecture. Okay. Next time, when we're, or not next, actually a week from now, when we go through and we start applying some loads, we'll open this very same file in Revit structure instead. And structure has the ability to put loads and boundary conditions. And no, you aren't doing that. In fact, even for your project in assignment four, I'm going to show you how to put structural elements in. It's not at all my intent that you're going to completely model the structures. You, know, you don't have to do that for assignment four. The intent is really just to show you how to put the structural elements in. So for some key areas where you want to put some beams or columns, you can. You have that in your toolbox. But no one's asking you to go through and model the complete structure. Yeah, that would be, it would be much, much bigger. No, you're not doing that yet. Yes. Yes. Actually, you won't, you won't be doing that in this class. How about that? If you take, there's some good classes next quarter I can recommend <laughs> that you do that, but it's, uh, we're not doing that this quarter. OK, we'll go ahead and choose beam, the beam tool. Beams, of course, have sizes in the type selector. We can stick with these existing sizes, or we can go ahead and load in some new sizes from the library. I'm not going to load them in right now. If we did go ahead and load them, you could actually get like the complete steel catalog if you want that. Uh, let's see. Uh, OK. You're going to talk me into going down there. Structural, framing. Let me go to steel as a starting point. Yeah, there's concrete doesn't have very many. In this in the steel wide flanges, there's actually the whole steel catalog in here. So you can choose a few sizes that you want to load and then they'll be available for you. Don't load too many different things. If you load an awful lot of things in there, just your model gets heavy and it starts slowing down a little bit just because it's taking more memory to kind of manage all those objects. Okay. But we're gonna go through and put in some concrete beams. Let me go ahead and put in these 16 by 32s. I'm going to do it in the 3D snapping way. I kind of like that. When I do 3D snapping, it sort of overrides everything else, because I can just snap to the top of those things. I can just snap to the top of those things. So choose the top. When you get to the top of the column, see how it sort of gets that little pink mark right at the top there? It says we're on the end point. So I'm just snapping away. Watch out as you're working. In fact, that last one I think is a little bit off. I think that's a little off. Let me rotate it and see. When you start working in 3D, if you get too far oblique, now it's actually okay. If you get sort of too far out of plane, it's actually hard to do things in 3D, and you might get things a little bit inaccurately. So you might have to rotate your view around a little bit. Okay. 
So you can go ahead and place your beams this way. Now, as usual, you can go ahead and place all these beams individually, and that would be OK. But you know that would kind of get tedious after a while. So you might want a quicker way to go through and place those things. So let's talk about how you can do that. If I want to go through and place beams, but I want to use one of the quickie methods, like on grids, you'll see that it's not available to me in the 3D view. That's because in the 3D view, you can't see the grids. Okay. So what I'm going to need to do is go to one of the 2D views. And if I want to place those beams on level 2, okay, because they're supporting level 2, what I'm going to do is go to the level 2 floor plan. Okay. You come on in, you can see ever so lightly, those beams are down there. I'm just kind of ghosted out. But at the level two floor plan, I can go through and place some more beams individually by drawing them. Can you may like to do it that way, but I'm going to undo that because I'm going to use my shortcut, which is on grids. Okay, so I'll choose on grids, and you know I would really like to just put beams along that grid line. In fact, I'd like to put beams along that grid line too. And what it's going to do? Oh, actually, what I have to do is. Control click to get all of them. Then when I say finish the selection, it'll put all those beams in. If I go back to 3D, you'll see it kind of completed it for the other two rows. In the same sense, I'm going to go back and go through and do it in the other direction just by choosing the grid lines in that direction too. So its rule was that if it's on the grid line and there's two columns, it'll try to put a beam between those columns. So again, I'll come back over here to level two. I'll say, let's go ahead and put some beams in here. I'll use the on grids. I'll say along that grid. Control click to get that grid. Finish our selection. And before you know it, you got something that looks pretty good. So far, so good. Let's go ahead and give you a minute to catch up with that. Now, all these beams that I placed in there, it's not quite exactly the way I want this building to be, so I'm going to make a little few changes. You know, what I want to do is actually in this area right back here, I actually want that to be like a big open atrium. So I'm going to actually take out a few of those columns, or take out a few of those beams, excuse me. I just want that to be a little more open in there. So I'm not going to put a floor plane in that area. Exactly. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> it's not at all an accurate model. This model is around longer than the wind casino. <laughs> okay. So you go through, you put your uh, columns in there, you go through and put some beams between there, and we're doing pretty good. This is our basic structural frame. Before we put a floor slab on there, let's go ahead and put just a little more detail in there about the structure, and here's the issue. These bays between the different columns are actually pretty far apart. That's like 25 feet by 35 feet. It's really too far for a single flat plate of concrete to go through and span. We need some intermediate beams in there. Or in, you know, if it was steel, we could put steel uh, open web joists or something like that. If it was wood, we could put some wood joists between there. We very often have the notion of main beams, girders, which are sort of picking up the main loads. Okay, and then smaller beams or joists, as we often call them, that span between those and really carry the floor loads back to the main main beams. Okay, so there's a similar sort of idea going on here, and where it sort of shows up in Revit is as a beam system. Okay. A beam system is really just a group of beams that all have the same size, that have a very fixed spacing, okay, and a regular pattern to them. Okay. So for the big beams, it doesn't make so much sense to use them that way, because they were all rotated in a very special way. But as we go through and put joists between those, okay, they're going to be every four feet, every 16 inches, every six feet. There'll be a very regular pattern to them. So we can use the beam system tool. Let's go ahead and show you what it looks like. Okay, What I want to do is actually, I'm going to go through and put a beam system inside these bays, Okay, inside each of those different little bays. 
And I can do this in 3D, but to do it in 3D, I need to go through and just give it a little bit of help. What I need to do is, there's always this notion as you're placing things of what the work plane is, or the placement plane. That's where it puts things in 3D. And in general, it's been set to the first floor. As we were placing the beams, we were actually able to snap to the top of those columns so it, that it, know, it knew that the top of the columns is a good location. What I'm going to do is actually show the work plane. It's over here in the toolbar, or in the ribbon, over on the right-hand side, show work plane. You'll see it actually is down on the first floor level right now. And what I'm actually going to do is raise it up to the second level so that when I place this beam system, they'll be at that level as opposed to being down on the floor. I want them up with me. So I can do that as follows. I'll say, let's set the work plane. I'll bring it up to level two. Say OK. okay. And now it's a little hard to tell, but it's actually on top as opposed to underneath. The reason I'm doing this again is I want my beam system to be up here, not down on the floor. So what can I do? I will now go through and define a beam system. And you'll find it. It's just right underneath. Okay, Here's the beam system. It's right underneath beam. And when I choose beam system, what you're going to do is as follows. You're going to choose the boundary for the beam system. And then you're going to go ahead and fill that in with beams. And you can choose the beam size and what the spacing should be. So to choose the boundary, I can draw the boundary. What I like to do is actually use the Pick Supports tool. That'll let me just pick existing beams. So I can pick a beam, pick a beam. I'm filling in that little area right now. Notice as I pick the beams, one of the beams, the very first one I collected, actually has two parallel lines on the other side of it. Okay, And that's indicating that's the direction that the beams that fill in are going to be parallel to. So as we fill in, these beams will be running in this direction. Okay, Let me say finish that beam system. And we'll make some adjustments to it. Okay. You see I have a bunch of beams. Okay. Now the reason they ran in this direction is again because when I placed them, let me grab them by hovering and getting the big uh, collection of purple. Um, edit the boundary. I can, if I want to change the beam direction, I can choose as opposed to the boundary line. I can say, make that the beam direction. It'll switch it over that way. Kay. Other things I can do are, if I grab the beam system, I can actually change the distance. Right now, they're every six feet. I can make them every four feet. Okay, Or I can change the size. Okay or even change the type, make a bunch of steel members in there. Okay. But I can go through and very quickly change them. And the nice thing about beam systems, if you have a very regularly spaced system, it's much better to sort of define them as a system where you can change the properties of all of them as opposed to changing them all ind independently. OK, let me can I say OK. We'll choose that. And I'll switch those back to concrete. Let me do one more bay, and then I'll finish up for today with a big piece de resistance for today's class. Let me go through it. I'll put some beams in here. Again, I'll finish the beam system. They'll run in that direction. So I'm basically just filling out the bays. Okay. As a next step, what I would do is actually put a concrete floor slab on top of all that and sort of finish up that whole floor. And we'll do that next time. We'll do that on Tuesday. But what I want to show you, even more important than that, is sort of a very special trick, which is available for when you create multi-story buildings with very regular structures, how you can sort of repeat the structure. Because the idea is, let me just turn off that work plane so we can, can't see it. We've been doing all this work to create the structure for level one. But in a lot of buildings, level two looks an awful lot like level one, and level three looks amazingly like level two, and so on. Okay, So here's how that works within a tool like this. Let me go over to the uh, elevation, and you'll see currently I have level three and level four defined. If I want to, I can go to the level two and define some more. I can offset them some another 12 feet floor to floor. 
and I can add in some more floors. The numbering's off right now because I had done some things to sort of uh, mess things up, creating more levels earlier, but it's just creating additional floor levels. Okay, so I'm just adding floor levels to this thing. Let me even wait. You click the level tool and you can either draw them, or what I did in this case is I just offset them from an existing one. Okay, and that's the roof level. Okay, now the reason I've created these different levels is if I would like to take my structure and copy it up to all those levels, I can do that. And here's how I would do that I'm going to grab my structure. Here's the structure. I'll just grab all those different elements, kind of like I grabbed all those different elements and moved them into a work set. And what I'm going to do is just say, copy them to the clipboard. And once they're on the clipboard, I can do something called pasting them in an aligned way. And I can actually choose some levels. So if I want to take all those things and really put them on all these other levels, I can say OK. And after a little bit of work, Pasting, pasting, pasting. And there's a lot of work. There's a lot of elements in there. <laughs> Let's go ahead and let it finish. There we go. Kind of take a look at this. So pretty quickly, I've created the structural frame for an entire building. Now, there's a lot of stuff missing in here just because I jumped ahead to the copying. If we finished out those other bays and we went through and we put in the floor slabs, we'd actually have a very quick model of a seven-story building here. And that's actually uh, pretty quick, you know, considering we did all that in the last 40 minutes or something like that. Okay. But this is something now we can go ahead and take and go do some analysis on or really use this as our structural skeleton you know, as we do our architectural design. Okay, so let's go ahead and quit there for today. Just want to give you the idea that you can put structural elements in, and the real advantage of doing that is A, we can do the analysis and do put the placeholders in there, but B, we can do this paste the line and really quickly generate entire towers. Yeah, what's well, good enough for seven floors, but boy, if I was going to do this for 100 floors, I'd have saved an awful lot of time just doing it that way. Okay, let us quit there for the day and um, what we'll post uh, meeting with the TA tomorrow we'll post some office hours that are going to be available for the weekend for coming in and getting some help with the assignment and just getting set up with your work sets and your phases and your design options and there's so many things flying around that are all different layers of information the important thing is just jump in and let's try and get the framework set up so that you can then start doing your design okay so that if nothing else, we have stubs for level one or phase one and phase two and phase three and stubs for your design option A versus option B. You, know, you want to get a lot of that stuff set up so that even as you go through and complete your detailed design in you know, next week as you keep on going, you, know, you just have the basic framework set up so you can be working effectively as a team. So we'll post some office hours to help you do that this weekend and also through most of next week in terms of doing that. So uh, go ahead and get yourself started so we can take it, uh, get the most advantage out of our time together. Okay, great. Let us break.